fellow fish keepers. It's Mike with the Fish Tank Barn. I'd like to welcome you back to another video. If you're looking to amplify your aquarium experience, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, ding the notification bell, so you don't miss any updates here on the channel. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, the highlights from the 10th Annual uh, Marine Breeding Initiative, otherwise known as the MBI Conference. The goal of the MBI Conference is to educate both professional aquarists and hobbyists regarding ornamental marine fish aquaculture. So today we're going to show you some of the highlights from the conference, including snippets of the talks that were given by the speakers. So uh, let's go ahead here, and we're going to kick it off with Kathy Leahy, who is a hobbyist breeder. Uh, she's bred many species of clownfish, as well as one of the only people uh, in the United States from a hobbyist level to breed Centropygy angelfish. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started with the speakers. Tell us for chlorine, that's very cool. You want to be sure that you really, really gotten rid of the bleach because the thing I'm going to do next will not survive the bleach and that is to see it with bacteria. So you can buy bacteria um, that from Dr. Tim's, from Fritz Salt 109, that is the right bacteria to uh, take care of ammonia. And if you seed the tank with that first before the head of had a chance to get there, you're ready to go when the head of troughs arrive when start, things start to decay. You've got your your filtration essentially in place. And this has really worked for me as far as my control is, is uh, concerned. And it's it's amazing. I, I actually don't really understand how you can put bacteria in a bottle, put it on a shelf, and then sell it to somebody weeks, months later, and it still works. I don't get that. Just living things, you know, they need food, they need air. But it works. That's what I can say. I do wait a day before I add my eggs, my fish eggs and my larvae. I don't know what it is, but maybe they coat the eggs or they do something to them, but I have really bad luck if I try to do it all at the same time. <coughs> I'm every kind of fish feeder on the market when I first started doing clown fish. And the thing is, all the other ones are kind of dump feeders. They have a little hole with the cylinder turns, and the stuff dumps out. But you see, you have no control over how much comes out. Even though they have those little doors, it really doesn't make a difference. You feed too much, and you don't. You don't you're not feeding when you want, necessarily. You're not feeding. There's no control. You can't tell if it's been fed or not. Whereas in this case, when you feed, these boxes become empty. So you can tell if the thing's working or not. Also, it has a little air port, a little hole with a little nipple on the bottom side of the speeder. You put your airline tube in there, so you're blowing dry air over your feet all day. So the moisture from your basement doesn't condense on the food and make it inedible and rotten. All right, I really enjoyed Kathy's talk. Uh, quite a bit of good information, uh, some pretty effective ways to do things for the uh, home aquarist who's trying to do some captive breeding. Uh, so we're going to go ahead now and uh, jump over to Dr. Paul Anderson. Uh, he's doing, uh, he did a talk called the Framework for the Selection of Aquarium Fishes uh, to Target for Aquaculture. Uh, it's a pretty interesting talk. I didn't get a snippet of it in here, uh, but uh, he does quite a bit of interesting things. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk. So let's go ahead and listen to uh, Dr. Anderson. Um, the industry and to, to businesses in the industry. So as you know, there's a dizzying array and diversity of feeds out there, um, and it's hard to choose, you know, which, which are the best ones for, the, for what you want. Um, so, you know, we have juvenile raw feeds, uh, probably um, the, the most diversity in terms of feeds that are available that are of interest to aquaculture is served in stock conditioning foods, right? And you've got, you've got a ton. You've got a ton of pellets, you've got flakes, you've got, you know, frozen, uh, uh, freeze-dried, etc. And in such a crowded market, um, if you're a food manufacturer, how can your product outshine the competition? Well, the answer is through data. Uh, so uh, we, uh, Mr. McCray and the Marine Science Marine High School, have developed a feed validation protocol for food manufacturers 
Uh, and the benefits of a company investing in this feed validation protocol is that data validates products and performance. I had a salesman come to me and say, you know, when I go to sell my product at a, like, let's say a public aquarium, and they say, well, how does this food do for, you know, producing fish? And, you know, well, he could say it's great, but, you know, he's just, that's just coming off the, the tip of his tongue. He really doesn't have any data to support it. Well, if we do a feed validation study for those companies, uh, we can provide you with data and graphs that you can then take to your customers to say, here's how our, our, our feed performs and why you should buy it. Well, I really enjoyed Dr. Anderson's talk. I uh, talked about quite a few different things. I uh, did capture some of it here in this video on the camera. I uh, did speak about the uh, Marine Magnet High School in Connecticut, which was a pretty cool uh, high school that you could study uh, marine aquaculture and marine husbandry at, which was pretty interesting. Uh, so we'll hear more from Dr. Anderson here on the channel. I did get to interview him after the conference was over. So I uh, look forward to that coming up. Uh, so now we're going to head to Noel Heinsen. Uh, he is in the Dominican Republic. He was the uh, first person to ever breed Antheus. So uh, definitely a pretty accomplished breeder. His talk was uh, setting up a commercial aquaculture facility in uh, the Dominican Republic. So let's go ahead and uh, listen to what Noel has to say. So the next step was starting to build the filtration systems. So we're really big into the, the moving bed reactors, the, the fluidized moving beds. And so um, with that is it's basically a bunch of biomedia, all these little plastic um, media that has a bunch of surface area for bacteria to grow that's suspended in the water column. And it's highly um, like suspended in its uh, heavily aerated so that there's a lot of oxygen going through so you can maximize the bacteria being grown in these uh, moving beds. <clears throat> so, let's see if this plays. Oh. Inside the room is our shrimp larval system, which is otherwise known as the SLS system. And this is really important to have a different system than the molars. If you'll notice, they're a very different shape. And that's because we want to keep the shrimp larvae suspended in the water column because uh, our main focus for this is peppermint shrimp, which are highly chemicalistic. They will eat the hell out of each other if you don't keep them off of each other. So we have these deep conical tanks that keep them suspended. So we inject water down through the middle and keep them flowing. <clears throat> but other than that, I mean, it's got a lot of your typical things with the other larval system, filtration and whatnot. But the other really important thing are these black tubs up here. And why those are important is because it actually regulates your flow for the rest of the system so that it ensures that it's all the same flow. I mean, you have valves on these so you can manipulate it and decide what kind of flow you want, but this way you're not getting back pressure either, and you're able to keep it going. But what's really, really handy is when you're living on an island that there tends to be power outages, and if you have highly cannibalistic animals that want to kill each other, it's really important to keep them off of each other even when there's no power. So what is great about these is I can stand here for hours and dump water up there and it'll keep the system flowing and keep it at the same level that I have it at and I have to worry about manipulating. The shrimp stuff was incredibly interesting uh, with the shrimp set up and uh, basically how you have to keep them moving in order to keep them from predating on each other. So definitely uh, pretty interesting stuff there. So uh, now we get to the uh, final talk of the day. Uh, it was uh, Matt Pedersen. He is going to be speaking about uh, the orange spot filefish. Um, it was kind of an update to a talk that he gave uh, at the second MBI conference. So uh, he was the only person, I believe still is the only person, to successfully raise the orange spot filefish in captivity. So definitely follow along with this. It's pretty interesting stuff. Uh, so definitely some people do need to take the reins of this and uh, push it forward uh, so we can get this fish into the hobby as a captive bred species. So uh, like, without any further ado, uh, let's go ahead and uh, let Mr. Pedersen tell us uh, what's going on. And uh, that makes you really want to do it. Um, we're being told something's impossible and saying, no, it's not impossible, we just haven't figured it out yet. So these are all cores now. It's a uh, Ketodon malactoris is the orange and black one you see running around from the Red Sea, the Arabian butterfly, and uh, Trifasciatus there, one of the red fin or melon butterflies, that one's from uh, the Indian Ocean. Uh, those are now two plus years in captivity. Those are not supposed to be alive. Uh, those are not supposed to be eating prepared foods. Those are not supposed to be doing all those things. And so I wrote about pretty much how I did it here, and there's another installment, but this is the issue uh, that my uh, editor decided to send as a donation. So if you did not get one and you like what I ta I'm talking about today, um, this is an important issue to get. Um, but what I'm going to do today, Tal and I talked about this, 
And uh, since it is the, I am starting MBI and now closing it here in Michigan for the 10 years, um, I'm gonna give the talk that I believe this is the talk I gave, um, or one of the talks I gave early on anyways, um, in MBI history, if you will. So let me see if I can shut this down and we'll get the ball rolling. Uh, this might not have been the first one, but. <clears throat> so, I don't know how many of you have ever seen me give my Harlequin Filefish talk. Or, uh, how many hands? Show of hands. So this is actually going to be new to a lot of people, and that's what I thought. It's been a long time um, since this information was out, since this information was published. I said, you know, I bet there's going to be a lot of people there who haven't seen this. So we can get away with giving this talk again, because I haven't bred any butterflies yet. I've had maybe a possible mating or two between those fish, where I just kind of caught it out of the corner of my eye, like, oh, they're chasing each other around the sink right before dusk, and that looks like nuzzling, and I didn't get anything. So, um, and I'm not even trying to hide it as it's just the pair that's alive and doing well. But uh, rethinking Harlequin Filefish. So, uh, why this talk? Um, no one has replicated my work yet. It's been 10 years. A few people have taken what I did and spawned the fish, gotten some eggs out of them, but no one has replicated this yet. Um, uh, I said I was gonna save the MDI some money. You don't have to pay me to come give a talk I already gave. I'll just come and give a talk. Um, so uh, there are concerns, we have these ongoing concerns about long-term access to wild fish in the future. We've seen it happening with corals, the, the loss of access to corals from Indonesia, Fiji. I mean, when Fiji's coral exports shut down for a long time, the fish exports also kind of shut down. And now the fish are, exports are back a little bit, but just the, the companies that were doing fish exports relied on corals too for their business. So we have these, we've got to breed stuff if we want to have access to it, it's that simple. Um, uh, and I want to issue a challenge, which we'll get to at the end. So um, beyond that, there's, there's more to breeding than clownfish. That has been my mantra now for years. So my disclaimers. I can't cover everything here, so grab the back issue uh, or a digital download. It's not in our current digital archives for Coral. Uh, when we moved to digital platforms, we had to change some stuff up. But I believe you can purchase a digital copy of this. So, Get a hard copy, get a digital copy. I put everything I did in a nice condensed format, and here's the recipe, uh, everything I know. But this is definitely not for beginners. If you've never kept uh, a complicated fish before, I wouldn't say to anyone, jump and do this. Um, and what works for me is maybe not gonna work for you, and it's far from the final word today, I'm sure of that. Uh, and there's a lot more to be discovered. It could be that the reason no one has replicated my work is because I overlooked something. Yes, Kathy? Did you detail your work? I think it's back on it. <laughs> so, so, all right, final statistics of the Harlequin Filefish. Yes, we can have fun on the last day for all friends here. Um, Oxalonacanthus longerostris, the common name this fish has. Harlequin Filefish, the reason I like Harlequin Filefish and I use Harlequin Filefish is because it's a, it's a common name that is unique to this species only. The one that we all know, Orange Spotted Filefish, well, there is another species from the Caribbean that also gets called Orange Spotted Filefish. And you know both are both are good, but um, you know I, I like Harlequin better. Long-nosed filefish is perfectly acceptable. Uh, if you're in Australia, it's the beaked leather jacket, totally different name, but that's what they call it. Uh, it's a widespread fish. It's native throughout most of the Indo-Pacific, and uh, it's a smaller fish. Its max size is five inches, but usually we see these fish at like three inches. They're not a big fish. They're great from a size standpoint. Uh, and this is the problem: natural diet is almost exclusively live small polyp stony corals. That's what they eat in the wild. They eat the things we like to keep, our colored sticks. So they have this general reputation in the hobby that they're doomed and to avoid them. And that was definitely true 10 years ago. It's still kind of true, but things are changing. So um, just how doomed. I love this from, uh, this is the most descriptive phrase I've ever heard, cut flowers. Fish that would be enjoyed for a couple weeks, which would then wither and die. That's Bob Fenner who said that. He called them cut flowers. They're, they're things we just take out of the ocean, we look at them, they're pretty, and they will wilt away and they're not, and we throw them and we move on. It's not an acceptable use of an animal, but that really hits home just what, how, how strongly he felt they should not be collected. Um, oh, this is the rest of it. Rarely alive for a week in captivity. And he was right when he said that back, he wrote that probably in the late 1990s, and that was true. Minimum tank size for a pair, 10 to 25 gallons. Um, you can do it in a tent. I, I know that because the first ever captive spawning report of Harlequin filefish was in 1994, or maybe even earlier. It was on, um, how many of you remember the Breeders' Registry? I think it's still up. It was on the Breeders' Registry. And, and reading that report was like, well, okay, now I know a lot of things about that report were wrong, but I still believe that report actually happened, and it happened in a 10-gallon tank. Um, these are butterflies. These are hummingbirds. These are fish that are constantly grazing on the reef. 
little, I'll pick here, a little, I'll nip there, I'll take a little tiny piece here all day long. When you feed these fish just once or twice a day, they starve. It's not that you're feeding them the wrong thing, it's that they're not getting food frequently enough. These fish need constant availability of food. Uh, and what I've done, what I've kind of gotten to now with the coral or butterflies is using the Rakashi gel food, uh, which coats the coral skeletons really well, but it also lasts in the tank an entire day, unless they eat it all. So I can leave that in the tank 24 hours and those are great, whatever they want. And that's what you saw the fish doing uh, earlier when I had that video playing. And that, that was just a chunk of gel food in that net breeder and all day long they can just eat. I don't have to feed those fish at all other than put in a chunk of food. That's fantastic. I don't have to, when I was doing the Harlequin file fish, they were by my desk and I could just throw some pellets. Throw some pellets. Oh, I'll go get up for a take up the stretch. And <coughs> I don't even have to do that now. So I think that Harlequin file fish are mostly reef safe. A lot of people have put them in reef tanks and they have not destroyed their corals. Yeah, they might pick on one. Man, you might not see as much polyp extension or they'll be closed, which is actually kind of natural for a coral of the day. They're not always out there waving their polyps around, you know, they're, they're <laughs> waiting. So, um, yeah, so the, this is the big one for me. Males really don't like each other. Males are intolerant of each other. One male per tank. Um, I really think carbon file fish are a pair or single fish. If you're just gonna have one to just have, that's great. Otherwise, pair. would not do two females or two males in the same tank at this point. Um, you can keep them in trios. I did it. Um, and they're really good for other peaceful passive fish. You know, put them in with other slow feeding fish, other grazing fish. They really do well in those types of scenarios. I kept them with things like cardinal fish, palm fish, uh, uh, other stuff. So they often come in, they're very timid. But once they settle in, they become very assertive feeders. And they're usually, like you saw in the video, very bold and assertive. They're not shy, but they're not aggressive towards other fish. So some of the pitfalls I ran into. Premature additions or pairings. Basically, it just means putting the fish together before they were really ready. They weren't well established enough. They hadn't uh, built back all the reserves to go through that next hurdle of being paired up uh, and working out their social differences. So you gotta be patient with these fish. Uh, having little substrate area. And basically now I think I've kind of figured that out, that if, I, if you use uh, some sort of feeding station, which I did with some of these, but if, if that food can just sit there all day and they have a place to go for it, that will work. But in the past, I just, you know, there'd be pellet food all over the substrate and they would pick at it and eat at their leisure. Same kind of concept. Um, high flow, of course, tends to blow the food away, but I think I can now overcome that by using, a, a, in essence, a feeding block, something, a food that's gonna stay stationary. Um, aggressive tank mates, these fish can be bullied away. So you put them in a tank full of boisterous fish, these might suffer as a result. You know, a bunch of tangs in the tank, pounding on that feeding block is not gonna work they are gonna to need to be one of the more dominant and assertive fish in the community. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier with skipping feeding, these fish starve and, and die really fast if you withhold food. They need constant food. Um, poor water quality, again, they need top-notch water quality. They'll go off of feed, and the coral or butterflies do the same thing. If I skip a few water changes, oh, all of a sudden, like, what? they stopped eating. They've been eating this fish, this food for six months, right? Then I ate it. Do water change, they start eating again. Um, Moving them, they don't tolerate moves very well. And this is actually, I'll just jump in here and say, this is kind of how my story ends with Harlequin file fish was when we moved to Duluth 10 years ago, one of the two in the pair that was actively spawning and producing died within two weeks. I had that fish for like a year and a half, two years. These fish are sensitive to transport and I knew what I was doing. I knew how to transport the fish well. They were in transit for less than 24 hours. They don't handle moving well. Um, and then getting complacent. And I've been guilty, I think every person in this room has, at one time or another, kind of just like walked away from it and be like, oh yeah, it's fine, everything's doing great, I don't have to worry about it right now. And uh, yeah, things change, and when you're not paying attention, you don't notice that they change. That is how I lost one of my really well-established crawl, uh, crawl over butterflies. Uh, just recently, had a pair of them, and then one day I come down and the other one's torn to shreds. Wasn't paying enough attention. I didn't notice the warning signs that something had changed in that pair of fish. So just some examples of some of the uh, file fish I've kept in the past uh, in their tanks, in their reef tanks, uh, you know, certainly in with SPS, and hey, that, that bird's nest still has its polyps out. It's not getting shredded by that file fish. Um, and so we're gonna go into this part. Now we're gonna talk about breeding. If you can keep these guys alive, that is the goal, is to breed them. Um, kind of flickers your tail open and close. Um, let's see here. And uh, so all of that leads up to the actual act of spawning. 
and that's it, it's over. <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot of women are disappointed in that. Um, so, pretty much, um, it, it's, they, all this behavior leads up to just synchronizing this egg, egg deposit with the male and female coming down, putting their ventral openings right next to each other, and releasing gametes, and it's over. It's done. Um, they do like to mix it up. They're not always in that particular pitch al uh, patch of algae. Um, this time it was on a bunch of hair algae they let grow. And then there's another little uh, you know, flutter dive from the male, and you can see she's got that really neat coloration going on. Uh, he's all excited, yay! <laughs> so, um, they'll even go uh, and change it out in different positions too. I think this is the one. They'll go head to toe in this one. Um, and notice everyone else knows what's going on at this point. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, part of the thing here with this is this is all happening next to my office desk, and, and so I would notice, I'd be at work at home, so I work from home, and uh, I would notice the behavior happening, and I would just, okay, I'm uh, off the clock, and I would sit there and watch and record and do stuff. So, um, again, that really that female portrait dress there. You'll see the male comes down, and he nuzzles her, and he kind of chatters her, and that's, I, I don't know what that is exactly, other than maybe helping to time. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so maybe help with time that hey, we're gonna go now. This is it, let's let's get this done. But it all happens very quickly. Um, so video over three. And you can see very quite clearly this fish is kind of looking emaciated. He's sitting there eating baby brine shrimp, and uh, that's all he really wants to eat. I should say he, but we don't know. Uh, so here's 77 and 45. So the second oldest is now looking like this. Uh, and there they are again, 77 to 45 days. Notice how close they are in size. Notice how thin this one is looking at 77 days. That's the first one. Um, and there he is from a better angle. Looks looks nicer than it is, but uh, this is 80 days. This is the second one at 48. 88. Or uh, no, see, this is this is where it gets interesting. This one is the 88 year old, uh, 88 day old one. This one is 56 days old. This one has just settled down. And this one back here is 42. This one has surpassed its older sibling in terms of size. And you can see it right here very clearly. This is the younger fish. This is the fish that's eating otohime, spirulina flake, other prepared foods. This is the fish that really won't eat anything other than brine shrimp. So there's always a learning curve when you're trying to do something new. And 93 days that first captive bred baby expired. It didn't make it. Um, Meanwhile, the second and the third were, they were going along like crazy. So my, my working theory here, my hypothesis, is that that first baby didn't wean on the prepared foods early enough, but I had no idea when to do that. Um, so there is one last thing I do want to show you regarding the MBI conference. Uh, it is the award given to Tal Sweet. It was called the X Prize for his uh, contribution to marine breeding uh, by putting together this conference for the last 10 years. Uh, so this conference was a little bit bittersweet for me, uh, just from a personal note. Um, uh, looks like this conference may be moving from Michigan in the future, so uh, that will be definitely different. So you know, in life, you know, the only constant is change. So uh, unfortunately, it may not be down the street for me anymore, uh, but definitely still um, very much worthwhile event. So uh, obviously, um, I'll let you guys know on one of the live streams what the. Uh, the future holds for the MBI in terms of its location. So uh, with that being said, let's go ahead here. Um, if you're not subscribed, obviously please subscribe. Uh, watch the videos that come at the end after the awards presentation to tell. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, roll the awards. Aquaculture in our wonderful hobby for the last 10 years. Have a wonderful weekend during your event. And uh, our good friend Kevin Erickson also uh, wanted to say something uh, about our 10th anniversary, so he sent me another clip. Hello, Tal, the MBI. I congratulate you on 10 years of your amazing show. Thank you so much for all you do. We try that one more time in the middle somewhere. <laughs> Alright, so we're gonna, I guess we're going to move ahead. <laughs> so thank you Kevin and Tom from uh, MASNA for recognizing the work that's been uh, accomplished here. And uh, so yeah, 10 years is pretty fantastic. Um, and
And uh, so as Tal was saying, uh, Martin uh, had written a rather lengthy letter, but uh, I was asked to read it. I will do my best to, to read it. I'm no Martin Mo, never going to be a Martin Mo. So uh, it reads, congratulations. Ten years at the helm of MBI, not an insignificant achievement. MBI has done a great deal over the years to advance the breeding of marine ornamental fish and invertebrates. Development of new techniques, new species, new feeds, dissemination of long-established knowledge, new knowledge, and new con confidence in what can be achieved has all passed through the camaraderie and information exchange that is the MBI. I'm sorry I couldn't make it to number 10, uh, but I'm an old guy. Not an old guy, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and the complexities of old guy life are catching up with me. But I haven't tossed in the towel yet, although it isn't as wet as it used to be. I'm in the process of finishing up the Diadema Culture Manual on the culture work that took me through 12 years and five hurricanes before I could wind it up. And I'm not sure where, the, where it will wind up, but somehow it will be available to anyone who is interested. When I started that project to culture Diadema sea urchins back in 2006, the importance of copepods as larval fish food was just being widely recognized, and development of copepods as a critical first food for many species of marine fish was in its infancy. Clownfish gobies and other species did well on rotifers as a first food, and that part of marine fish culture was well underway by the late 70s. Aqualife research established in 1992 on clownfish and goby culture moved to the Florida Keys in 1974, and there in 1977 we were able to spawn and rear the larva of the French and gray angelfish and even create a hybrid between these two pomacanth and angelfish. That's the year I was born. <laughs> I discovered the fundamental importance of copepods in their earlier life stages, copepodites, when we began fish culture. At that time, we found it was the only way they could be reared through the larval stage that was with copepods. And the only way copepods could be obtained at that time was to pull a huge plankton net for an hour or so behind a small boat. Oh, the stories I could tell. But back then, wild angelfish could be cultured, collected without regulation and sold wholesale for under a dollar. So when you calculate what a cultured six-month-old juvenile angelfish would have, would have to sell that to make a profit and feed the kids, well, you do the math. But the work that we did then, and the work of Sid Kroll and Frank Bosch soon after, laid the foundation for, no, the other, the other word for it, explosion of experimentation and accomplishment over the last 10 years or so in the culture of many species of tropical marine fish that are, no, were, impossible to breed. And MBI was and is instrumental in the advance of this technology. So Gene, I wish I could be there with you all, friends and colleagues, but I hope you're having a great time and expanding your knowledge, experience, and determination. I do plan to go to Mackinac in Orlando later this year. I can drive there in a couple hours, so I hope Barbara and I will be able to meet and greet many MBIers there. With best wishes, Martin Skip Mo. So thank you, Martin. So, you know, it's been 10 years, and uh, I'd like all the MBI council members, past and present, to come up on stage just for a minute. Um, 10 years, and without our sponsors, the speakers, the attendees, these past 10 years, there would be no workshop. So I want a round of applause for everyone who's come every year in and out. This is fantastic. <laughs> We'd just like to take a moment to thank Hal for his dedication to sustainable aquaculture, for all those long hours of work he's put into making the MBI workshop a success for 10 years. So everyone, please give Tal a round of applause. <laughs> also, Tal likes hug, so everyone make sure to hug Tal. Right there, Tal, right now. So, but that's one, there's one more thing we, we want to do here, and, and that is awarding an award that's never been awarded before. So, Shall we would like to nominate <laughs> 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 the X Prize, the, the pinnacle of prize that we have, uh, the, the, one of the fundamental things that it requires. Uh, there are many qualifications, many ways you can get to an X Prize, and this one is being awarded by the entire MBI Council. Well, we do now. <laughs> so, for the unparalleled dedication to advancing the ideals of science, research, 
knowledge, transparency, friendly competition, and I think most importantly, fellowship among those who culture marine organisms. So, um, uh, Josh was right here for you, and uh, someone will take a picture of this uh, right here. Uh, so, Tal Sweet, our first and only X Prize winner uh, in the NDI. Thank you. In addition to the X Prize, oh jeez, Jesus <laughs> Christ, we think it's well, I guess. Um, so this is, you may have all seen a MASNA award before. This would be, I guess, we would call it an MBI award uh, from all the uh, uh, council members and everyone at Reeds. Uh, MBI honors Tal Sweet for his dedication to sustainable marine ornamental aquaculture, July 27th, 2019. Oh. Lots of rum for about a year. But I guess he's working too, so everyone, welcome, Noel. <laughs> 